Hey everybody, welcome to Intermediate Accounting One. We have a video here today where we're going to take a look at one of the financial statements that doesn't get a whole lot of love. You know, we spend a lot of time throwing love at the cash flow statement. We throw a lot of love at the balance sheet and the income statement, but we don't really talk a whole lot about the statement of shareholders equity. So today I'm going to kind of change that a little bit. We're going to get into that, show you what goes on the statement of shareholders equity, and also kind of show you how to fill one out. And hopefully along the way, you gain a newfound appreciation for this financial statement, because it is one of the five required financial statements according to GAAP. So we need to know how this thing comes together. So let's go ahead and take a look at one here. We'll pull up the financial statements for Nike. Uh, obviously, we're familiar with what Nike does, and we probably have a pair of Nike shoes on our feet right now. Uh, I get the balance sheet up right here because before we can talk about the statement of shareholders' equity, we really need to begin with the balance sheet because as we know, that shareholders' equity is going to show up on the balance sheet. And here we have it at Nike right at the bottom, shareholders' equity. So the statement of shareholders' equity is going to give me more detail of what we're seeing on the balance sheet here. Uh, specifically, it's going to tell me exactly how the numbers went from here to here within the course of the, the year. Not to, not to rhyme or anything, but uh, from here to here within the course of the year. Um, but anyway, the shareholders' equity portion of the balance sheet is going to be broken down into a couple of parts here. We have a part for contributed capital right there. Contributed capital, uh, that's the amount that the investors have put into the company. So we have common stock, the par value of common stock right there, and then we have the excess in par that people have paid in to buy that common stock or uh, paid in capital in excess of par as some books call it. So that's contributed capital right there. And then we have earned capital. Uh, we talked a little bit in our face-to-face -face class about that other comprehensive income, and we'll look at that more in depth later on. And we also talked about the retained earnings being the cumulative profits that have been held by the business and not uh, spent, basically. So we have contributed capital and we have earned capital, and that gives us our total shareholders' equity for Nike. Now, there's a financial statement that shows us how those balances go up or down from year to year. And that's our statement of shareholders equity. So let's go down and take a look at that. Not you cash flows. We don't have time for you right now. There we go. Check this out. Statement of shareholders equity. Across the top, we see all the categories that we saw on the balance sheet. We have common stock and then we have paid in capital in excess of par value or stated value. That area is our contributed capital. Then we have our earned capital, accumulated other comprehensive income. And like I said before in class, that's basically just a dumping ground. Uh, we have these paper gains on uh, certain investments that we have or maybe foreign currencies that we hold. And when those go up or down, we have a paper gain that we haven't locked in if we haven't sold it or closed out that investment. So that paper gain has to go somewhere. Uh, we for various reasons, we don't want to include it in income, but we have to book it somewhere. So we just dump it in this kind of catch-all category called uh, other comprehensive income. And we'll spend a lot of time later on talking about what exactly goes in there. But that's just kind of a little background for you. And then the other part, retained earnings right there, our cumulative profits that we've held in the business. And you can see we got a bounce at the beginning. And then we got all these different changes that go along throughout the year. And then we got a bounce at the end of the year. And what makes this kind of a weird looking statement, because it's usually not laid out like the other ones, we have... Three years of data here. Yeah, here's my balance at May 31, 2017. My change is in that year. And my balance in 2018. And my change is in that year. And finally, I've got an ending balance that I can match back to what's on the balance sheet. So as you can see, the changes that are happening from year to year. Um, I've got some repurchases. We've talked about treasury stock when a company buys back its own stock. Uh, we got some of that going on. That's a reduction of equity because we're pulling that stock out of the market. You can see it shows up as a negative. I've got dividends that I'm paying on that stock. It's showing up as a decrease in retained earnings. And I've got my net income, which is showing up as an increase to net earnings or retained earnings, I should say. And I've got other comprehensive losses that I've or gains that I put in there also. So that's basically showing you how the balances in the accounts at the top are changing from year to year. That's our statement of shareholders equity. 
We have one problem that I'm going to walk you through real quick after that introduction. This is on your homework set number five, and it's completing a statement of shareholders' equity. And again, I, I keep pointing out, and it's important to keep this in mind, we're not just doing this as some kind of exercise in theory. If you look at what we're making here, the statement of shareholders' equity, it looks basically the exact same as we would see a real company, a real business. So we're learning things that are the way things are done in the real world, the way they really take place. It isn't some kind of thing where uh, this is just an exercise in theory. I mean, you know, you'll learn the real stuff later on. Uh, this is it. This is how it goes down. According to Gap, this is how companies are doing it. That's why you need to know how to do it, especially if you're on that four-year degree CPA truck. So on January 1, Powder Company provided the following equity section of the balance sheet. There's my contributed capital, and there's my earned capital, total shareholders equity, and then we had a few events in 2019 that we need to put down here. So, first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and label my statement of shareholders equity, and if you aren't at the point where you feel comfortable doing that off the top of your head, feel free to grab your book, look at an example, feel free to go to the internet and pull up a, a real company, and use that as an example to kind of guide you. I'm just going to wildcat it here and we'll throw in a few things. You've got our beginning balances right there at the top. And then I'm going to kind of look at the boxes here and we can kind of look at the events that occurred and uh, kind of put two and two together and figure out what needs to be labeled here. You'll notice I got a box in common stock and a box for additional paid in capital on common stock. That tells me, well, we must have issued common stock. So I'm going to put that in. I've got preferred right below that. I'll throw that in there. The difference between common and preferred mainly revolves around dividends and voting rights uh, for the shareholders. Common stock uh, normally has voting rights attached to it. Um, preferred stock normally doesn't have any kind of voting right attached to it. From a dividend standpoint, preferred stock is preferred because they get their dividends first. Uh, so if a company declares a dividend and they have preferred stock and common stock, preferred stock gets paid the dividends first. And if there's any left over, the common stock shareholders get them. So that's kind of why they call it a preferred stock issue, because they're preferred in terms of dividends. Also, in the event of a company liquidation, Preferred stockholders are one notch above common stockholders in getting some of those proceeds, if any, are left over after the creditors have been paid. Yeah, it looks like we have some retained earnings hits here. So I'm going to put my net income there. I'm going to put my cash dividends paid on preferred and common there. And I'll put my ending balance right there. And from that point, we're just going to start plugging in some numbers. I want to put my beginning balances in, and I'm going to pause for a second to do that so you don't have to watch me type. So there are my numbers right there. I've got all my beginning balances put into my statement. And from that point, I just have to put in the events that have happened. We issued 1,800 shares of common stock at $13 a share. Notice that the amount is broken up between the par value for the common stock and the additional paid in capital. If I paid 13 or if I received $13 a share, $5 of that per share is going to go here. The other eight is additional paid in capital. So I'm going to multiply five by the number of shares that I issued. Five times 1,800. And I get $9,000 that goes into the par value for common stock. The $8 above par is additional paid in capital. So I'm going to take 8 and multiply it by 1800 And I get 14400 So all told, we sold common stock and received proceeds of 23400 Because of that archaic accounting rule about par value, we have to assign the par value portion and then the excess portion. We have to split it up. It's just a bookkeeping thing. We have a total of 23.4. Exact same idea for the preferred stock. On that issue, we had 340 shares. We're going to split it up between a $100 par value and the additional paid in capital. The par value is 100. We got 130 per share. So 100 will go towards par value. 30 will go towards additional paid in capital. 
So we'll bang out a little bit of math here. We issued 340 shares at 100 bucks a share. Probably don't need a calculator for that. There you go, 34,000. Additional paid in capital on preferred stock. We have $30 excess of par, 30 times 340. We get 10,200. I'm gonna add those together. I get 44,200. Looking good so far. Net income, we always want to add in net income to retained earnings. We have 38,950 according to the problem. We'll plug that in. We had a cash dividend paid on preferred, $7 uh, per share dividend. So how are we gonna handle that? We're not given an amount for how many shares we have, but we'll use a little bit of uh, accounting know-how here, and you gotta use our brain a little bit to come up with a number. So if we had 92,800 on the books for preferred stock, and it carried a $100 par value, we should be able to take 92,800 and divide it by that par value to get the number of shares that we had at the time. So we had 928 preferred shares out there and we issued another 340. So to that 928, I'm gonna add 340 for a total of 1,268 shares outstanding. Now y'all, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that $7 per share dividend and multiply it by that amount. I get 8,876. Common stock, exact same idea. We gotta figure out the number of shares we have going on and then we gotta figure out what we added and then we'll get our dividend. We had $5 par, 37,400 on the books. So I divide that total by the par value. I get 7,480 shares outstanding. I issued another 1,800. I did that, 9,280. We paid a $1 dividend. I can do that math in my head. 9,280 times one is 9,280. So at that point, we just have to put in our ending balances. We're just gonna flip the columns here and add them up. I'm gonna go ahead and pause and do that. So there we have it, I've got my totals footed. One thing I did kind of uh, tweak right here, I made sure to put my cash dividends paid as a negative uh, because we know that when we're paying those dividends out, we no longer have retained those profits in the business because we've released them to the investors. So I've made sure that those two show up as a subtraction from retained earnings. Similarly, if you have a problem where you have treasury stock, where you're buying back stock, that would show up as a negative as well. So I made those negatives and then I footed every one of these columns and I've got green check marks everywhere. So that's how we take care of that statement of shareholders equity. And again, that whole idea of equity is literally a residual interest. It's what we have left over when we subtract liabilities from our assets. If we kind of tweak that accounting equation to say assets minus liabilities equals equity. Equity is what we have left over, okay? So it can, as we find out, as we move along and go forward, sometimes it feels like the uh, shareholders equity section of the balance sheet just kind of becomes a dumping ground for things that we can't figure out where to put in other places. But uh, it's a very important statement. It's important to know how that comes together because it is one of the five required statements according to GAP. So that's how we do it. If you have any questions about that, please let me know and I'd be happy to help. Uh, we'll begin our discussion of the income statement next week. I hope to see you there.